was the evening of December 13th, 1862. His name was Richard Rowland Kirkland, and it was the middle of the night, and there were hundreds of soldiers on the battlefield. And on both sides, they could hear the screaming and the cries of the men that laid there, but no one wanted to go out to rescue them for fear they'd get shot too. So the story goes that Richard Rowland Kirkland talked to his general and asked for permission to go out there, and at first he said no. Eventually, the general relented, and Richard Rowland Kirkland asked to carry a white flag so he wouldn't get shot, and the general said no. But throughout the night, he went out there, not worried about his own life, giving aid to Union soldiers, his enemy, even though, right, even though there was no reason for him to do so. How does this help us understand the fifth commandment. I guess it's a modern day, right, parable of the story about the Good Samaritan. I think it helps us understand the fifth commandment because there is a positive side to the fifth commandment. Not only does God tell us, do not murder, but we start to look at the fifth commandment and Martin Luther's explanation to the fifth commandment, you see that we should fear and love God, do not harm our neighbor in his body. But what? Help and befriend him in every bodily need. And so this morning, I, I want to help us understand what that part of the fifth commandment means and really how God wants us to show a love, not just to him, but show love to our neighbor. And to do that, we're going to focus our attention on those words of the parable of the Good Samaritan. And one of the things about the story of the Good Samaritan, if you were living at the time of Jesus, all of the parts of this story made a lot of sense to you. That road from down from Jerusalem to Jericho, the Jericho Road, was known throughout history as a very dangerous road. Early in history, before Jesus came, it was known as the way of blood. Because of its narrow path, because of how it was, the rocks on both sides, because everything that it was, if you went on this road, if you were in battle, it was almost a suicide mission because people were hiding, could easily kill you. If you were going to walk on this road from Jericho to Jerusalem, you had to be very careful because that was a place where robbers would come steal and probably take your life too. So people knew that, and so when Jesus told this parable, they got that image. They understood the perilous journey that this person took. In the parable, right, there are four main characters in this parable. You, you have the man, the, the Jewish man that probably, uh, against better judgment, decided to make that journey. You had the priest, Right, the highest part, the highest leadership, I guess, in the organized church. You had the Levite, right? The Levite was the person that worked inside of the church, inside the temple. It was their job to assist the priest. And then you had the fourth person that everybody hearing would understand. You had the Samaritan. That Samaritan and what he meant to the Jewish people is kind of hard for us to comprehend today. There's actually some even disagreement to a certain degree about the Samaritan people. But, but generally speaking, this is a map of Israel at the time of Jesus. And there is a land of Samaria, right? And the Samaritans lived in Samaria. That, that's north of Jerusalem there. It's in the blue. And Samaritans trace their ancestry back to the people of Israel back to the times of when Israel was together, but then if you remember, there was a divided kingdom. You had ten tribes to the north and two tribes to the south. And in 722, the Assyrians came in and they conquered the northern tribes. And so you remember what happened in that time frame as when 
people from the outside would conquer a people, one of the things they would do is they would bring their own people in. They wouldn't kill everybody off, but they would start to intermarry. And so suddenly you have this group of people in the north that, I guess for lack of a better uh, genealogy, they were part Jewish and part Arab. And so came the 500s B.C., when the southern kingdom to the two tribes there, they were taken off too into Babylon. And then they were allowed to come back. You had the northern and the southern. Those two groups did not get along. They had a different thought of how you should worship. The Samaritans thought they had the right worship. The Jewish people thought they had the right worship. And so for hundreds of years, this racial foment, this religious foment, they started just being at each other. And so that was the position now when Jesus came. Samaritans and Jews just did not get along. That's the parable. And so now Jesus tells the story, right? And so the Jewish man walks down and he is beset by robbers and he is naked and he is left for dead. And so the religious establishment shows up, the first one sees him, and even though, right, the priest and the Levite, by law, were supposed to help this person. This is a Jewish man on the road. They didn't. Whether they were scared because if they would stop, maybe the robbers would get them too. Whether they were just in a hurry, whether they were just callous, Jesus doesn't say, but two men who should have helped didn't. But the third man did a Samaritan who shouldn't have helped. And the Samaritan had pity on him. And you start to understand what pity and what mercy means. And I think it's one of the neat things about this parable because we're trying to figure out, okay, what is showing mercy? What does it look like? Mercy is often shown in action. And you start to take a look at the mercy that was shown by the Samaritan, right? He took pity. He went to him. He showed up and he was in the presence of this man who needed it. He bandaged of wounds. He, he found his medical care and, and he made sure he took care of it. He put the man on his donkey. He gave him transportation to get to this place. He gave him shelter. He gave him money. We didn't have anything, right? You start to see what pity and what mercy looks like when Jesus showed the actions of a Samaritan with a Jewish person. And when Jesus tells this parable, this expert in the law who thought that he was right with God because he, he honored God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and he loved his neighbor, suddenly Jesus shows him, you are not right, not only not right with me, because you do not love me with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, you also are not right with me because I expect that same love to be shown to your neighbor. And when that person was confronted with that Samaritan, he knew he knew he wouldn't have done that. Author had recently uh, um, said that if we would be telling this parable, we wouldn't tell it the same way. We would tell it differently, the author would say, and I think I would agree with him. He said we would flip-flop the hero and the victim. We would say the hero was a Jewish person and the victim would have been a Samaritan. Right, maybe put it in more modern terms. If you want to teach someone or, or teach a child what it means to be a neighbor of everyone and who is your neighbor, and if you kind of use the framework of this parable, how would you say it? Right, that you're walking down College Avenue and you come across a homeless person. And then maybe you want to use the religious elements that a priest would walk by on one side and he'd see him and he'd go across the street. And maybe a pastor would walk by and sees that person in need and walks across the street. But then another person who lives in Greenville sees the man in need and helps him. But Jesus wouldn't tell the parable that way if we looked at how he told it. Instead, what Jesus would have said was, a person from Greenville is laying hurt in the road, and a priest walks by and goes on the other side, and then a pastor walks by and sees him and goes on the other side, and then a homeless person sees him on the ground and helps him. 
You see why Jesus made sure that the expert in the law saw himself as the victim. Because until you see yourself as the victim, you probably don't quite understand when God says, love your neighbor as yourself means. Because if I was hurt, or if I was in need, or if I could not help myself, right, I want someone, I want someone to take out some of their time to help me. If I was a victim, I would want someone even to risk some of their own safety and security to give me aid. If I had no money in my pocket for whatever reason, man, I, I would just want someone to just help me when I'm down on my luck, to just give me a little bit of support. Right, when you see yourself as that person, it changes everything about showing love to your neighbor. It changes everything when it shows how you love your neighbor as yourself. And it better helps us understand why Luther would add in that fifth commandment's meaning to help and be a friend to him in every bodily need. Right? How do you do that? It begins um, the way Jesus began the parable, right? You can't forget the pretext to this parable. You got to remember that, that the person thinks that he is right with God. You have to remember that the person is trying to trap Jesus, trying to get Jesus maybe to say something negative about the Old Testament law. And you have to remember that when it came to, to this person's life, that he wanted to justify himself. That I am living in such a way that God is okay with me. So to truly know what pity is and to truly act and give mercy to someone, you have to see yourself as that spiritual victim. That whether you, that is a Samaritan on the road, a, a person that is immoral and, and so different from me, th that he is separate from God, that I am no different from him because we come to God with the same thing, with absolutely nothing. Right? It's just what Peter said. God did not redeem us with perishable things. God did not redeem us with gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Christ. So when I understand that I am valuable to God because Jesus gave his life for me, when I understand that everybody out there has that same value, that Jesus gave his life for my life so I can have eternal life, that's what I begin, that's what helps me understand my job to show love and mercy to others. And then there's a second thing. One of the clear things in the Bible is that God connects true faith with action. Right? The book of James. Faith without deeds is dead. The Apostle John would write, if a person sees another person in need and has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Jesus says, right, in Matthew 25, as he's talking about, right, getting into heaven, he says these words, I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. So for us to think that there is no connection between our acts of mercy and true faith, man, the Bible says just the opposite. But the connection is not to pat ourselves on the back. The connection is not to help us be more right with God by thinking, look at what I'm doing, God, to help these person. The connection is that God loved me so much. Now he says, show that same love and mercy that I've had for you, for others. But here's the tough part. Today, many, if not most, growing and thriving Christian communities are in areas where people's felt needs are already met. 
couple days ago, I took the bus from Watertown Plank Road in Milwaukee with my family, and we took the city bus from there down to Water Street near Summerfest. And when you go from Watertown Plank Road and, and you take the bus down to Summerfest, it goes all the way down Wisconsin Avenue. And, and I used to live in Milwaukee a, a long time ago, so I do remember what those places used to look like. And even 20, 30 years ago, it, it was still having some issues. And I remember even my dad telling me, and, and one of the things I noticed in this last trip going on Wisconsin Avenue, I, I see all of the churches. And, and they truly are shells of their former self. Uh, many of them are still operational, but, but you see, they're not thriving, they're not bustling. Some of the communities that you're driving on this bus and you're seeing uh, are impoverished areas. And you know what happened, right? A lot of the people that lived in those areas, they moved out to the suburbs where I parked my car before I went into the city. And they moved there for safety and security and because it was just a, a better place to live. The truth is, and we know it, we don't have to go down Water Wisconsin Avenue from, and taking the city bus in Milwaukee to see that. It's the same story here. Where are the growing and thriving churches in the valley? North Appleton? West Appleton? Southeast Appleton? Where are the areas that are struggling more? And the churches that are struggling? In the downtown. The downtown of Appleton, the downtown of Menasha, the downtown of Nina. I don't tell us this as an indictment on the church. Because the truth is this, our church body, we don't often plant or hardly at all put churches in poor areas. And the reason we don't do that is because our church planning model begins with the fact that that church, when it's planted, has to be able to support itself. And so for a church to support itself, it, it takes quite a lot of means of income. It's just a reality. And it's a reality that we all have to be aware of and know because that is the truth. And until you're aware of that reality, then you don't really see the needs that are out there. And so that's why the Christian community has to be more intentional, right? More intentional of finding those who need things. Finding that, that person that is wounded, the person that is hurt, the person that is, just doesn't have, for maybe no fault of their own, maybe all fault of their own. Because that's what God calls us to do. The record of the church isn't great, right, when it comes to this. But you ever think about why? Not why it's not great, but why God makes that connection in Scripture. Even though in the Bible it is so clear that your works and your deeds do nothing to get you into heaven, yet in the New Testament you see it many, many times about your works and your deeds. I think it's because of this. That when you show mercy to someone, when you show grace to someone, when you help someone who has no means to help you back, when you give aid to someone who does not deserve his, your aid, when you help someone who is in that situation because they have made terrible and poor decisions throughout their life, when you do that expecting nothing in return, that is the clearest way, the most transparent way, other than words, to show a person the love of and grace that's in God through Christ Jesus. Remember why God values life? It's because every soul is precious to him. That's why God wants us to show mercy and pity to people. Because that's the Christ-like action that shows people, not so much through words, but the love of Christ that he has for them and that he has for you and that you show to them. Amen.